It is great to be together to worship, to say we will praise, we will serve, we will love together. We do this together, we don't do it alone. And we gather here this morning in Jesus' name to worship together. As we worship together, we also bring our prayer requests and our hopes and our dreams and our visions together. And this morning, as we think of those that are listed in the bulletin um, with prayer needs, I also want to just give you an update. Um, Goldie Yoder was admitted, and she did have surgery yesterday to remove a kidney stone. I want to let you know about that. Mim Hoover is recovering well, and we are thankful for her surgery going well as, as well. We come from a variety of experiences this morning. Many of you are probably, at least in our house, frantically finishing up some 4-H projects, or maybe you're getting animals ready, or, or those kinds of things are on your plate. Perhaps that's where you're coming from. Some may be coming with overflowing joy this morning, and some may be coming with this unspeakable pain. But we gather together in Jesus' name, and we come together, and we bring our joys and our concerns together. If you're carrying a burden this morning or something that you would invite prayer for, I invite you to stand this morning just to be recognized, and those around you will remember you in prayer this week. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer? God, our rock, our refuge, our very resting place, we come to you. Out of a busy week of work and struggles to be meaningful, to find authentic work, we come to you. We come out of our desire to meet you here this morning out of our desire to find you, to find, find what you have for us today. We desire to know you in the center of our being. We thank you, Lord, the way you have moved, your healing hand, the touch that anoints. We thank you for the way you are moving. And we ask you, Lord, to be present where there is hurt where there is need, to be that balm, to be that healing touch. And as we, the church, the body gather, may we also administer that healing touch through you. You are so good. You are our provider, our very breath. And we thank you, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This week also, some things are happening here, and we have our Vacation Bible School that begins tonight, and many of you are involved with that, and hopefully some of the children will be coming. We have some exciting things that we're doing tonight, starting at 6. So I invite you to pray for us. Pray for the ministry that happens here tonight and throughout this week. And then next Sunday, we will be presenting our final story, and you'll be hearing the children sing, and I think you're going to really enjoy that. At this time, I just want to invite the ushers forward for prayer for the offering. And this morning, we also have Bertha coming forward with a little dress. And I want to tell you about some of these dresses that they've been making. The Women's Sewing had been working with a program called Hope for Women International. And I don't know if you want to hold one of those up, Bertha. It's like a pillowcase dress. And these dresses, from what I understand, this program began in 2006. And these girls in different parts of the world who don't have anything to wear need one dress. And if they have this one dress, it gives them a much better chance of not being picked up by a predator or someone that wants to take them into child slavery. By having a dress, it means someone cares for them. And there's a label that they put on the front that has it, uh, the, the name of the organization. And that also deters people because it means they're being cared for. And so our women's sewing has made, I believe, 65 or more so far almost at 100. And so there's other churches, there's other people in the area. This is a, a national program, but we're really excited. We want to dedicate these dresses to the girls who will be receiving these dresses and their ongoing journey. So that's part of what we want to offer this morning in our offering. Would you just join me in prayer? God, you are so good. We offer our lives. We offer our gifts of money. We offer our time that we've put in forth into these dresses 
We ask a special blessing on these dresses right now, that God, may you be glorified, may you be lifted high, and Lord, I pray a hedge of protection around those girls that will be receiving this dress, that they may be kept safe, that they may be kept whole, that your word may get to them in some way across the world where we don't even know. We ask a blessing on these dresses and this program as they receive them. You are the giver of all good things, and we thank you, Lord, for this blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and worship with us again. 
Uh, if you see us getting into it a little bit up here, you're more than welcome to do the same. <laughs>
salvation. We just pray, God, that you would have this service be completely dedicated to you, that all of this energy that we are feeling, Lord, all the worship, it's all for you, God, one purpose, and that's to glorify you. We just pray this in your name. It's really exciting to be here this morning and just to sense God's presence. And things as big as God can happen here and are happening here. This morning I've chosen to <clears throat> title the message, The Local Church, A Place for Healing the Wounded Spirit, taken from Luke chapter 17. You notice that one of the big sayings around here is that Clinton Frame is a place for you. In our vision, it's a, it's, a, it's a focus that no matter where you come from, one thing we hear sometimes is people say, if you only knew what I was like, you wouldn't really like me anymore. And we're assuring you this morning that this is a safe place for you. We're on a journey. And in our journey, one of the things that happens is we get wounded at times. And periodically, as a pastor, I like to stop because when we get wounded, we tend to kind of stop in our journey, and we get held up. And I like to just take some time this morning and just talk about woundedness. Proverbs 18, 14 says, that a person's spirit will sustain him in sickness, but a wounded spirit, who can bear it? Indicating that a wounded spirit can even be a lot more serious than physical sickness. And physical sickness can be tough. But a wounded spirit can be really tough. When I say that church is a place for you, that's what the church should be. In my travels across the church, I've heard some awful horror stories of pain that have happened in churches. <clears throat> One of those out east happened a long time ago, but the church in our denomination was building a new church. And so the argument began to take frame about putting the preacher up on a raised platform. Up until that point, the preachers would come in from the council room and they had a table up front, and the preachers would sit behind the table. And out east, you'd sometime hear it referred to as the bench because they'd sit on the bench behind the table. And whoever's turn it was to preach would pile the psalm books in the middle, and he would put his Bible on top of the psalm books and preach from there. Well, they built a new church, and they wanted to put in a raised platform. And the argument went something like this. Some of the people said, no, the preacher is no better than anybody else. He's taken from among us. He should be on the same level as everybody else. And that kind of made sense to some people. And others pointed to the book of Ezra and said, even Ezra, they put him on a pulpit of wood to raise him up so they could see him better and understand and hear him better. And that argument won. And so they built a new church, put in the raised platform, and on Sunday morning, when they were to have their first service, guess what happened? Somebody who opposed that went in on Saturday night and tore that raised platform out and made it level like it used to be in the former time. And they said it was a professional job. You could have never told that there was a raised platform in it. Imagine what the people's talk was as they came in that morning. What? And the bishop put in an investigating committee to find out who did that. It took them about two weeks, and they come back, and they said, John did it. So the bishop went to John and confronted him, and John said, I did not do it. Oh, the bishop said, the investigating committee said the evidence would stand up anywhere. And so the man sorrowfully had a large family. He left the community, but everywhere he went, the church would say, oh, we heard what you did up there. And he and his family sojourned around and had an awful time finding a place to go to church. 
Years later, in the same church, there was a man in the hospital dying. He called the bishop, and he confessed that he is the one who tore out the pulpit. They got the wrong man. And when the bishop discovered that he had accused the wrong man, the story is that he went down to another part of Pennsylvania where he found him, gathered him and his wife and his family around, and said he fell on his knees in front of them and just begged their forgiveness. That so impressed a young man that if you have the book in your library, Introduction to Theology by J.C. Wenger, John Christian Wenger, you'll notice inside the cover is a picture of Benjamin Weaver. That was the bishop. It so impressed John Christian Wenger that this bishop would humble himself and acknowledge that he was wrong. There are people sometimes that have these kinds of wounds that happen, and that sometimes in the church, I know what we mean by it. We say, I made my, wrong. my wrongs right. Let me ask you, how can you ever make your wrongs right? If we could, we wouldn't need Jesus. How would you ever make a wrong right to John and his family? You couldn't take back the words. You couldn't take back all the pain. You couldn't pay, take back all that his children suffered because of it. All you can do is to plead for forgiveness. Let's notice this morning this subject. Where do wounds come from? I list four of them here. In this Luke chapter 17, it mainly does the first one, from those who sin against us. Ed and I know a young woman today who's blooming in a Christian life, but at one point, at five years old, she saw her mom killed on a bicycle by a truck, and her father, who should have been the loving man to protect her, began a series of sexually abusing this girl until the time came she was almost numb with pain because she had endured so much pain. Today she's an artist and she's becoming a counselor. But she comes out of the wound of a deep, deep wound of being sexually abused by a loving hand, a father, who should have been there to protect her. The second place our wounds come is from our own sins and failures. I remember as a pastor, the first time I suffered for someone else in church was mad at me and taking it out on me, and it actually felt good for a change. At least I wasn't suffering because of my own sin, <laughs> but it was somebody else's for a change. But our own sins and failures cause pain. The third is from traumatic accidents or incidents. They can be accidents or what we simply call as tragic things happening in our life. Um, my wife, Edna, when she was five years old, her father died as a teenager. Her older brother was killed when he was guiding the spot of a ready-mix truck in, in a window, and the truck stalled several times, and so he raised the motor and crushed her brother between the truck and the building. Sometime later, her younger brother was killed on the way to work instantly. Her mother remarried, and her stepdad had an accident in which people were killed, and he died from it. And so when Ed and I married, we'd come up on an accident. She'd take my hand, and she'd very quickly begin to cry. And when I became a minister, I'd leave home sometimes, and she wouldn't go with me. She'd say something like this. She said, honey, Everything I loved, God took away from me. Now, that isn't true, but that was the wound that was coming out from this traumatic experience. Today, <clears throat> just a sign of healing of that, today when I leave, go for meetings, she's kind of glad to see me go. <laughs> gets, gets a break, feels like her schedule can kind of get more peaceful. And uh, <clears throat> as a sign of the healing has happened. The fourth is from unhealthy responses to people who have our good in mind. There's a lot of times people will mistake discipline 
which the Lord says, whom he loves, he disciplines. Parents who they love, they discipline. And there's sometimes, I was just talking with a mother this week who her biggest thing is that she wants to be liked by her children. It's very hard for her to discipline them if she only knew in the long run that's what will bring respect. But in the meantime, sometimes we have unhealthy responses to people who have our good in mind. I was talking to a man recently who carried a wound for years on the farm. The tractor gas tank was overfilled one day and it kind of spilled over the side and he said that his dad made him get up and start the tractor so that if it would explode, it would kill him and not dad. Well, I, I knew his father. His father was one of the bravest men I ever knew. And if there was any danger, the father would have stepped into it. But the son misinterpreted that, that incident on the farm and, and felt wounded by his dad. Just because we're hurt this morning does not necessarily prove that somebody wronged us. Often in the church, when someone's wrong, we're convinced that somebody sinned against them. And it may be, but it doesn't necessarily prove that. So what is your life situation this morning? How are you acting out of the wounds of your past? I described you about Edna's when it comes to, to, to deaths in her family. The emotional upheaval she would experience is, is, is to cry and the lie she would believe about God was that God takes away everything that I love. And often at the root of a wound, we catch ourselves starting to believe a lie. We catch ourselves being angry at God, believing something that really isn't true. And so, before I go on this morning, I'm asking you, can you give God permission this morning to continue your journey toward healing? There was a time as a young man, I would kind of poo-poo things. Why do people get hurt so quick? Get on with life, you know. Get over it. But today at my age, I now understand a whole lot better how you can run from wounds and hide them, deny them, and I have only in the last 10 years got in touch with some of my wounds that I had long denied because God began to bring that kind of healing. And there's a real way that I had to give God permission to say, okay, I'm willing to look at it. I'm willing to talk with you about it. I'm willing to explore it and go into it. Why is this such an important issue this morning? It's because wounded soldiers cannot go into battle. If you're wounded this morning, you're going to catch yourself sitting on the sidelines. Because you got burned once, you're not going to get burned twice. And there are people in the church this morning that are sitting on the sidelines because they've gotten wounded, and they don't want to go back in to the battle. The second reason this is important is because bitterness has long held unforgiveness about a wound we received, and unforgiveness hinders prayer. When we pray the prayer our Lord taught us, it goes like this, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And when we find difficulty forgiving those who sin against us and the wound festers and it turns into bitterness, it begins to hinder our own prayer. And thirdly, because hurting people tend to hurt other people and it gets passed on. Hebrews 12, 15, look after each other so that none of you will miss out on the grace of God. Watch out that no bitter root of unbelief rises up among you. And if it springs up, many will be corrupted by its poison. That's the devastating way that bitterness works. People who are bitter, they're not happy unless you're bitter with them. They want you to be mad at the same people they're mad at. They want you to be angry at the same situation that they feel hurt by. This is not in your notes, but I just want to take a little side course to an Old Testament story about a priest by the name of Ahithophel. His name's even fun to say a little bit, Ahithophel. He was David's senior priest. Ahithophel had the reputation as a priest that every word he spoke 
seem to come directly from the mouth of God. Wouldn't that be a wonderful reputation? And yet when Absalom, David's son, led his revolt against David, Ahithophel was the first one to join Absalom. And you wonder, why would this priest do that? And then the counsel he gave Absalom, the first thing he told Absalom to do, he said, put tents on top of the rooftop and you go in and sleep with your father's wives just to insult him and cause that kind of reproach on your father in Israel. And then this priest Ahithophel gives some strange counsel. He tells Absalom, he said, let me choose 12,000 men and attack David while he's weary. Where do you see in the Bible a priest is that anxious to go after somebody and kill him? And he says in chapter 17 of this passage, 2 Samuel, I will catch up with him while he's weary and discouraged. His troops will panic. Then I will only kill the king. What's going on with this priest, Ahithophel, that he wants to kill David personally himself. David was concerned about Ahithophel. Another young priest by the name of Hushai joined David in his fleeing from Ab Absalom, and David said to Hushai, you know what? He said, I'm kind of concerned about something. He said, I'm concerned about Ahithophel and the advice he's going to give Absalom. He said, you would do me more good if you would go back and confuse that counsel. When Ahithophel gives counsel, you try to confuse it. And so, after Ahithophel told Absalom that he wanted to go after David and have these 12,000 people and kill him personally, Absalom turns to Hushai and says, what do you suggest? Hushai said, I'll tell you what. He said, your dad's an experienced warrior. He's just like a bear who's been robbed of his cubs tonight. And he's an experienced warrior, and he said, if I were you, I would wait. And I would muster up all of the men that you can get in Israel, a full-fledged army. You think this through carefully, and then you go after David. And the Bible says, when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, because Absalom thought that David's, Hushai's counsel made more sense, Hushai went home, it says, and put his house in order and hung himself. Whenever I read a story like that in the Bible, I'm hard on that story. I say, God, why? What was going on with this priest? We catch the clue in just a few glimpses later on in the Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3 says, Bathsheba was the daughter of Eliam. 2 Samuel 23, 34, when it lists David's warriors, brave men, it says Eliam was the son of Ahithophel, the Gilonite. That made Ahithophel Bathsheba's grandpa. Get the picture? Bitterness ate away at grandpa until it did him in. And he took his own life. I tell that story this morning just to kind of as a warning because we catch ourselves sometimes rehearsing our wound, and we talk about it, we think about it, first thing we know, it can rise up and have a root of bitterness. And that's the poison of it. Turning more directly to this scripture now in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, it says that we all will face offenses in our life. Sorry, but you won't get by. In all of life, we are going to have offenses come our way. Somebody is going to sin against us. That will happen. That's part of life. But the Bible says, but woe to the person who offends, and it picks out especially an offense that we need to talk about a little bit. It says, but woe to the person who offends a little one, and the Greek word there means a less powerful person. The Bible takes a little pains here to talk about the seriousness of a wound that comes when somebody who's more powerful 
wounds less powerful. The person offending a powerless person, the Bible says it were better that a millstone were hung around their neck and then drowned in the deepest sea. That's drastic. It sounds drastic. But such unjust behavior calls for drastic action. If you're here this morning and you had somebody in your life, somebody powerful, somebody who should have been there to protect and lead and be there for you, and whether it was a father, a stepdad, or uncle, or a school teacher, or a boss, or a youth pastor, whoever it might have been, wherever it might have been, if you sit here this morning and you have had wounds from a powerful person like that, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And if you are a person here as a powerful person and you have wounded such a one, there is forgiveness. But the Bible sees that as drastic. And along the way, as a church leader, I felt it's really important to remove immediately. If somebody is being abused by a more powerful person, they need to be separated from that situation immediately because it's drastic. It does awful, awful things to somebody. I was in the Kroger parking lot one night. Ed had gone in to get a few things, and I began to see unfolding next to me a car where a father was beating up his son. He had a four-door car. He'd beat him up in the front seat, throw him in the back seat, open the back door, beat him up some more, throw him in the front seat. I went over there. I said, sir, I said, stop beating your son. He said, it's none of your blankety-blank business. I said, yes, it is, and let me tell you why. I said, you're beating up somebody else's son besides just your own. Have you thought about that? And he said, whose son? It's my son. I said, well, the Bible says in this same passage about powerless people, it says, and their angels do behold the face of their father. Over the years, I've pictured that where the angels are looking at the father's face and they're seeing a little one abused and the angels are looking at the father's face. What should we do about this? This is so unjust. What should we do about it? Some of the most difficult things I've ever handled in life have been to see little ones mistreated, abused, hurt. And when I finally told him that the Bible says that children are a heritage of the Lord and that his son was God's son before he ever was his son, I said, you're beating up one of God's children. And I said, you don't take that lightly. And he stopped in kind of awe of that. I don't know if it stopped it or not from then on. But woe to the person who abuses a little one, a powerless person. Verses 3 and 4 talk about wounds we get from church people. When you receive an offense from a brother or sister, confront him or her, the Bible says. When they repent, forgive them. If they sin against you seven times in one day and say, I repent, forgive them. And I can just see at that point the apostles, why the response was, it says, and the apostles' response was, Lord, increase our faith. It takes faith when you're let down by one that really loves you and you love. You know them well. They're a friend, a church friend, someone you trusted. And it's even tougher when you're asked seven times in one day to forgive. And so I could ask the question this morning from this passage, how do you pray for the healing of wounds? The Bible gives us some startling clues here. It says in verse 6 that you start with a little speck of faith. And the reason it says that is because a lot of times when we're wounded, We've kind of given up. We're kind of numb to it after a while. And it's going to take a little faith to move on. And you may be sitting here this morning and God's bringing that wound back to you and you're thinking about it, you're kind of sweating a little bit and thinking about it. Oh, but it happened a long time ago, but it's interesting you haven't forgot it. It's the first thing that comes to your mind when we're talking about wounds this morning. Or it may be a fresh one right now. 
but it's going to take a little speck of faith like a grain of mustard seed. And I want to encourage you with that this morning. Reach out. If you do that little speck of faith, God's going to meet you there. Just try it once more. And then it says, speak to the mulberry tree in verse 6, symbolic of the wound. Mulberry tree. That's an interesting tree. Do you know that in the city of Goshen, it's a city ordinance that you cannot plant a mulberry tree? Do you know why? The Jewish people used to say it took seven years to untangle the roots of a mulberry tree. <laughs> the roots of a mulberry tree are massive. And they love to get down in the sewage, any kind of sewage system. You've got a tile on your farm or whatever. A mulberry tree loves to get in there and just wad it up and plug it up. It's got a massive root system. And so Jesus didn't pick it out of the air. He said, you can speak to this mulberry tree. You can speak to this wound where all its family systems go, where all its tentacles have reached, wherever the roots have gone back in your family, great-granddad or whoever. However many relationships is affected, speak. You got this speck of faith. Speak to this mulberry tree. Have it uprooted, cast into the sea where it can't hurt you anymore and can't hurt anybody else. Uprooting a wound, it'll hurt to heal. It's like pulling a tooth. But you keep speaking the truth of who you are in Christ according to this, and God will bring the healing. You're not stupid. You're worried that you'll never amount to anything. That's not you. That's not who God made you. You were chosen by God. You were accepted by Him. You were redeemed. You were adopted. You're loved. He's put His Holy Spirit in you. That's who you are. That's who we are in Christ. The words of Jesus to the wounded are that He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Psalm 147, verse 3. Isaiah 53, 5. By His wounds we are healed. Luke 4, 18, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to set the oppressed free. So I'm inviting you this morning to let Jesus minister to your wounds. We have out in front of our house a pond, and to the left are some tall reeds, cottontails. They're nice sometimes when you dry them out, put them in the house, and now and then I've cut one and picked it and the wind's blowing a little bit, and I didn't notice that it was bruised, and all at once while I was carrying it, it went like that, and I looked, and sure enough, it had a bruise. Jesus' attitude towards you and your woundedness was that he'll be so careful. He'll be so gentle with you. Where you're bruised, he'll be so gentle that you won't break. He knows what you can handle, and he'll be there for you. The same passage in Matthew 12, 20 says, a flickering wick, he will not let it be snuffed out. Sometimes you may feel like your flame is just barely burning. It's about to go out. The dark of night seems on you. You don't know if joy will come in the morning or not. The flame's about to go out, and Jesus is saying, my attitude is that I will nurse that flame back to burning brightly again? I believe Jesus meant for the church to be a safe place for you to receive your healing. And in a moment, I'm going to ask those of you who feel like the Holy Spirit put in your heart that you've got a wound that Jesus needs to touch. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are, and I'm going to ask someone close to you so that you're not alone, just to put their hands on you. And we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for that mulberry tree to come out. Oh, it's a start in the journey again of taking care of the wound. My son, who's a doctor, psychologist, said to me one day, he said, Dad, I am so jealous of the church. He said, I have seen more people wounded by the touch of the Holy Spirit of God in the church 
than sometimes years in my practice. And so I know what can happen. I close with this story. I was speaking one time out near the East Coast on wounds, and that evening, uh, among others, there was one gentleman that just began sobbing and weeping during the sermon. And he came for anointing, for healing, for his wounds. Didn't know what his story was. Next day, he called me up. He owned a restaurant, and he said, there's a bit of lull in my business about 2 o'clock. He said, can you come? I need to talk to you. So I went, and we went down the basement of his restaurant, sat on a couple boxes. And this is what he said. He said, when I was a teenager growing up, he said, our family was poor, and we would, Saturday nights, mom and dad would hang a blanket between the living room and the kitchen. The boys had to take their bath in the living room, and the girls took theirs in the kitchen. He said, I hated those times. He said, it was my turn to get in the old tub in front of the pot-bellied stove to take my bath, and he said, out of the corner of my eye, I saw my brother get the towel and was going to snap me, and he said, just as I saw him, I come around my fist and to get him, and he said, as I did, the backside went across that pot-bellied stove and just took a layer of skin off of there. And he said, the smell of burnt skin, he said, anger just filled my life that night. It became symbolic of what happened to me the rest of my life. He said, I drove my wife away, drove my kids away. Anger consumed me, bitterness. And he said, last night, Jesus, come and invited me to take care of my wounds. And he said, you saw me weeping and got anointed. And he said, and I went home. And he said, I just couldn't resist the temptation because I always had the scars on my backside. And he said, I backed up to the mirror and looked. He said, even my scars were gone. He said, God healed me. His daughter, who was getting her psychology degree at a school, became so interested in her father's change that she wrote it up and put it in a video and a DVD and send a copy to me of her dad being a changed man. And so in the warmth of a safe place, if the Holy Spirit talked to you this morning and brought a wound that you're dealing with that you haven't quite made your way through in your journey, and you know it's there, and you, by faith, this morning would like this little speck of faith to move on in your journey and be able to minister to this wound and let Jesus minister to you in our closing prayer. I invite you to stand. Is there anybody? God bless you. Just have the humility to stand where we are. All right. Now, there's some of you that are close enough to them and I don't want any of them to feel alone. If you're close enough to them, then you can just put an arm on them. I'd like for you to do that in our prayer. If you're close enough that you can just put a hand on them. Dear God, this morning, I bring these dear people to you who have stood to identify a wound. It may be fresh, it may be older. But this morning, Holy Spirit, you've brought it for a reason. And I now, just on the invitation of your word, with reaching out with a little speck of faith, we say to this wound, this mulberry tree, wherever it's gone, whoever it's affected, the poison that may be connected with it, the pus, the infection, we pull it out in Jesus' name and cast it into the sea where it's not going to hurt anybody anymore. And Lord, we speak the truth of your word over them. They're your son and they're your daughter. You love them. They're chosen by you. They're adopted into your family. They're special. They've been redeemed. They've, they've got the down payment of the Holy Spirit. And I just pray this morning, Father, that they can lift their head up and walk out of here with confidence today that you deeply care about their bruised reed and their flickering lamp, and you're going to nurse it back to burning brightly.
and to being strong. Thank you for their humility. And now, Father, just fill them with a father and mother's love, your fatherly and motherly heart, and bless them. In Jesus' name, we ask for the salve, the oil of Gilead, the healing anointment. Just be upon them and heal the heart. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will the rest of you stand with us now? And we're going to lift up our heads this morning and sing this song in closing as a declaration of God's work among us. And I know sometimes in messages like this, it takes further work, and the pastoral team here is very open to following up with any of you that may want to talk more about your wounded situation. Bless you in Jesus' name. This morning, I want to invite those of you who stood um, or those who are around you just to come forward. We're going to sing Jesus Messiah this morning, um, proclaim, proclaiming that Jesus knew sin. He had no sin, but he came to be the only one for us. So we're going to sing this morning, Jesus Messiah. So if you want to come forward, you're more than welcome to do so. And just be together as a church and carry each other's burdens and help in the healing of those wounds.
and be the church this week. And may God's love and peace be on you. You're dismissed.